So, Neil, how are you? I'm okay. I'm not great. I mean, I'm, I, you know, I, I, because my wife is a genius and because our luck happened to be good, um, and because she simply happened to be finishing a 14 month tour in New Zealand, um, I was waiting for her in Melbourne, Australia, and we were meant to be going on a, um, we were meant to be going on a, um, hang on, sorry. We were meant to be going on a holiday together to celebrate the end of her tour. And of course that, didn't that that was obviously not going to happen and then i got a call from her saying new zealand is going to go into lockdown or at least people coming in are going to go into enforced quarantine um i think if you don't get over here immediately you are not going you and ash are not going to see me for two weeks or three weeks either i'll be stuck in New Zealand, or you're going to be stuck in Melbourne, or I'll be, you know, in quarantine in Melbourne. This is not going to work. So we better get together. And very we lucky. Did. And very so, lucky. So lucky. And we came out here. Um, Amanda cancelled her gig over the incredible protests of the organizers who were very grumpy about it, the promoters. Um, but the church, the venue that it was in, were really sweet about it. And they, um, we did this sort of, Amanda did this sort of strange webcast thing, and she asked me if I'd like to do something, so I read The Mask of the Red Death from the pulpit. Wow. At the, at the <laughs> Vicar's Quest, which I love. <laughs> and, um, and then read Goodnight Moon at the end of it. And... Then all of a sudden we were on this sort of strange enforced kind of holiday. And at the point where it became very obvious that we were about to go into lockdown, um, but before it had been announced, we rented a place to stay. And we were very lucky, very fortunate. We found a beautiful place. It has an avocado tree in the garden that we climb and pick avocados from. It has fijoa trees, which is a fruit that I was unfamiliar with, but which taste faintly perfumey and are slightly gritty, and but are kind of wonderful anyway. Um, there and it are, has books. And it has books. And I'm, I'm loving the book selection, which I think goes back to, seems to date back to the 1920s. Um, and it has an, a piano, which makes Amanda happy. Oh, wow. I get, I get books. She has a piano. And it has an oval billiards table. Interesting. Um, giant oval snooker table. And we have not yet tried actually playing with the giant oval snooker table, but one day perhaps we will. <laughs> and, you know, if it wasn't for the fact that it's three adults and a four-year-old, um, it would probably be wonderful, except that there is a four-year-old. He is a delight. He is a joy. He does not come with an off switch. Right. And we've now created school for him. So in the morning, he goes down to the billiard room, and in a corner of the billiard room, he goes to school. Good for him. Well, we, we are here, we are gathered here to talk about this beautiful book, which... Uh, I know you've seen, I, I've got, this is my only copy of it. Um, I love, by the way, for, I hope readers will be pleasantly uh, titillated by the dust jacket, which has footnotes on it. I think that's a first in the history of publishing. Uh, I, I just love the idea of annotating the cover. And it was the, it's the only, it's the only time I think I've ever come up with an idea like that where when the editor said to me, what kind of thing do you want on the cover? I said, could we just, couldn't we just annotate it? 
Um, well, and you followed through with one of the world's first annotated introductions. Uh, absolutely. So if you don't like footnotes, I, I, I've occasionally had, I, there was a review that I've forgotten where it appeared of one of my previous books in which the uh, reviewer said that they loved the book, but they were very disturbed by the clouds of footnotes surrounding the text. And of course, I wanted to say to them, do you not see the part where it says annotated on the cover? But uh, so here we're certainly giving fair warning to the readers what to anticipate. Um, so it was a joy for me to work on this. this is one of my favorite books of all time. Uh, and for you, it was kind of a, it was a blast from the past to some extent, I guess. This book, you wrote this book in 2000? I, I started it properly, I guess, in 1998. End of 1990. Started it in 1998, wrote some of it in 99. And then 2000 was the big writing, uh, you know, the year that it, it basically got written. So before um, that, you had only written one uh, book that started as a novel, Stardust. Uh, Neverwhere had not started as a novel. Um, yep. And yet this is very different from Stardust. Uh, why did you write this? Why, I mean, what motivated you to write this particular story, in this format? I had a book that I was contracted to write called Time in the Smoke, which I had plotted and which maybe one day I will still write or maybe I will fold into the Neverway universe. But it was a book about London and time. And I'd written uh, Stardust had just come out in paperback. Neverwhere came out as uh, in hardback and paperback. And I thought, you know, if I do one more book set in England or London, I will be perceived by Barnes and Noble's computer system as that guy who writes the semi-fantastic books about London. I thought, I don't think I can write Time in the Smoke right now. I think that's the wrong book to do. And in August of 92, I'd moved to America, moved to Wisconsin. And it had been a very strange experience for me because the, um, I, I was familiar with big city America. I was not familiar with small town America. And it was odd and it was weird. And I kept pointing to things and going, is that weird to you? And they go, no, 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 this is just the way we always do things. Ball of America, it's not strange to anybody, right? <laughs> it, but there, was, there was a definite sort of points where I kept going, this is really weird. And whether it was people driving cars out on the ice and waiting for the ice to melt and for the car to fall in every year, or whether it was you know, places, tourist attractions like the House on the Rock. Um, there were just things where I was like, I think this stuff is weird. And <laughs> I think I wanna understand it. I think I wanna tell people. And so for me, American Gods really, having lived in America by that point for about six years, was my attempt at trying to understand America trying to get a little bit under the skin of America, trying to actually going, I don't understand it. I know that I don't understand it. Let me go and have fun. And was slightly guided by a folklorist I, whose books I had picked up and read called Richard Dawson. And I just loved these Richard Dawson folklore books. I hadn't even, I think I'd probably read three before I realized it was the same person. You know, it's that thing where you, you suddenly notice that actually you're really enjoying these books by this person, but you were just picking them up because they were books about local folklore. And the, and there was just one quote, a Richard Dawson quote that, that stuck, 
with me about the idea that the gods had been left behind on the other, other, they hadn't crossed the ocean to America. And I thought, I think that that is a thing. And then um, summer of 98, I think I was in um, Reykjavik and I was incredibly jet lagged, incredibly sleepy. It was July the 4th, which seemed very appropriate. And um, I wandered into this tourist office and saw a tabletop diorama of the voyages of the noble Viking who had made it all the way to Vinland. Um, to Newfoundland and back. And I looked at this and I just thought, I wonder if the Vikings left their gods there when they went. And suddenly I had a book. Everything, it was like all of, it was like having a giant mathematical problem that I've been working on for years. And this tiny little thing became the the key to solving the maths problem and a couple of days later in bergen in norway i wrote an email um to my editor and to my agent saying this is the book there's a book that i'll write and the working title is american gods and I, I really did think of it as a working title. I didn't think of it as the title. Um, but, you know, uh, by the time I got home, I had a mock-up of the cover. This is the cover of your book, you know, was the original cover and is the cover of, of your annotated book. Yes. Waiting for me. And it said American Gods in big letters and it had that highway with the lightning strike. And it said Neil Gaiman at the bottom. And it looked like the cover of a book. You said, I guess I better write it. <laughs> and I also didn't worry anymore about changing the title. I was like, oh, okay. It's obviously called American Gods. And it's a, a, a quick, I'm fascinated by process because of course mine is completely different. Um, I don't announce to publishers anymore what I'm writing. I ask them humbly if I can, please write something. Um, and uh, I, I, in this book, in this annotated edition, one of the things I tried to do was to lay out for readers in great detail um, the process in the sense that the notes um, and appendices of the book reproduce um, some of your notes, some of your drafts, um, the footnotes compare various editions and drafts and so on. Um, and I love doing that because I love looking at text. But the point of it, from my point of view, um, is to help readers understand your approach to the craft and, and how you created this book. Yep. Um, so, I mean, you're, you're an outliner. Is that a fair thing to say, as opposed to a pantser who just sort of lets the story flow out? Or Um... Well, you read, you would read the outlines. Yes. Because you've, you, you've read them and I'm much more of a sort of outline as far as I know, and then keep writing. I, I'm, you know, I'm somebody who, who tends, I think in American Gods, I probably did it about three or four times um, to stop and take track of where we are and list all the things that needed to happen based on that. So it's a, I think an outliner is somebody who, and I can do it, I, it's just no fun for me, um, who does all the work in the outline stage, which is great, except for me it's, it's no fun. I don't get to surprise myself. I, I was going to ask about that. I was going to say, you know, it's clear to me that there must have been surprises along the way here. 
And do you want to talk about any particular ones or? Uh... I, I, I think there were definitely ones where um, I used the fact that I was creating these short stories that were also going to be part of the plot as a way of getting myself out of trouble because they meant that if I got stuck, I always had a short story that I could be working on. So I'd go, okay, I've, I've got shadow to Cairo in, in Southern I'm not quite sure where he's going next or what's going to happen to him. He's, he's met some Egyptian gods, but I'll leave him here for a couple of weeks and I'll go and write a story about for a 14,000 year old coming to America from Siberia. And I'll write that one. So those are your little holidays where you sort of, while you're doing that somewhere in the back of your brain, it's figuring out what Shadow's going to do next. Exactly. The, the, um, what Stephen King calls the boys in the back room or the boys in the basement. And they're, they're doing all the heavy lifting and I get to go and write something else. Um, and Lee there was, Child, I was going to say, was, Lee, Lee Child uh, has pointed out that, that uh, Jack Reacher re drinks coffee a lot during his books. He says, every time there's a coffee break, you know, it's me going to make some coffee to figure out what's happening next. So, mm -hmm. okay. So the stories are your coffee breaks. The stories are my coffee breaks. Um, or the stories are my, I have no idea what happens now. Um, and I need to figure it out. And it was, what I loved about the book was there was a kind of inexorability to what happened. Um, but you know, some things that surprised the readers surprised me. I readers go, we expected a big war at the end. And I'm like, I expected a big war at the end. I did not expect the thing that happened, which was, you know, shadow basically ending the war by announcing the explaining it. The, but one of the things that became more and more interesting to me as I was writing the book was the nature of a two-man con. You know, there are, there are themes that run all the way through American Gods. And one of them is the big store confidence tricks. It's the classic um, American, the idea of, you know, what is a two-man con? How does it work? We and we explain it really early on. We explain the concept of, um, you know, the fiddle game. We explain the bishop dodge. We explain how a two-man con works. Um, this book is, in, in large part, uh, I think, reflects your fascination with um, magic, coin magic in particular, and, and the con game, which is sort of in, in, intertwined. Uh, our friend Jamie in Swiss, I know, was a, a consultant on the book, and right. uh, uh, I, I'm I'm a very poor amateur magician myself, so I love that aspects of the book and was able to pick out. Well, of course, this came from Bobo's book, of course, and so on. So um, that that leads me to a question that I've had about your writing in general. This book in particular, Sandman, was very much the same, and that is about the research. Um, it's clear to me as the guy who ends up sort of checking out, looking up every little historical fact, every bit of trivia, every detail that you've worked in these books, that you have done enormous amounts of research. Where does that come in the process? Do you do the research? Do you just sort of store things up and say, maybe I'll use that someday? Um, or do you stop and then go look for something? And for example, I mean, as they're traveling around America, you have bits of local history that are essentially 100% accurate, uh, and uh, they have nothing to do with the plot. They're just they're just 
candies in the fruitcake. They're, they're, they're pennies in the plum pudding or whatever the analogy is. But, uh, so how do they get there and, and how do you work with that? Um, all sorts of ways. You know, it, it, it's like some of the research, I didn't do a lot of research on the gods. Didn't do a lot of research on the gods because when I started writing this book, I was almost 40 and I'd spent the previous 30 years, 35 years, whatever, reading stuff about the gods, reading every mythology I could find, reading that stuff. So that was there. The only gods that I really wound up doing whatever research I could on, which at the time was frustrating. Now it might be frustrating in a different direction um, with the Slavic gods. Yes. And the Slavic gods, I remember buying a book, like an encyclopedia of gods, and buying it primarily for the Slavic gods because I noticed it had them in there. And I, um, and I read all the entries and they were fabulous. And that's where I got, I, you know, I learned about Chernobog and Bielabog. I learned about the Zoria. I, I learned about Perun, the, the sort of the Slavic Thor equivalent. Um, and then I went to the back of the book where it had the bibliographies for every, um, every, every mythology and it had nothing for the Slavic gods. It was like, great, I don't, I, this was pre-internet and it was really hard to find stuff. So I found what I could, I made up a lot um, and now but, you understand that what you've written has become part of the mythology. Uh, I, I love that. Did I, I, What was that like for you, going out and trying to research? The, yeah, it was like, wait a minute, the, two of the Zorias seem to be real, but this third one, there's nothing about it. And then I would find web pages that would regurgitate what you had written about it as, as fact, which, yeah. of course, it was, but, you know... Uh, but it is that weird thing where I, you know, I, for a while, there was a very short while in early Wikipedia days where I tried to keep Wikipedia on track on <laughs> Doria. Um, and that lasted until the publication in 2004 of some mythology book, which included Zoria right. Polonaya in it which they'd obviously got from American Gods, but as far as Wikipedia was concerned, the published source with Zoria Polonochnaya now validated her. And I'm like, she's called Zoria Polonochnaya because I went onto the CompuServe forum, <laughs> the CompuServe Russian forum, and said, what would, what, would, what would Sister Midnight be of this set? We have the Dawn and we have the Dawn Star and we have the Evening Star, what would the Midnight? Uh, Zoria B, and they were like, Oh, Zoria Polonoch. I'm like, Great, thank you. So that was how she got named. Um, yes, well, the no, the, of course, the, the mythology parts of the book were challenging research because there's so many different stories. Uh, but, but having said that, there wasn't, you know, I there wasn't a lot of making stuff up with the gods. I had a lot of that stuff in there, I had the Norse stuff, I had right. a lot of that. Stuff in there. Um, and I was fortunate to have a really good text on Norse mythology that came out just a couple years ago um, by this Neil Gaiman fellow. So I rem I remember him. I hear I hear it's readable. Um, the um, and I did you know one thing that I did that I was really pleased now that I did was back when. Um, American Gods was coming out and I was just having to write, people would say, you know, can you write something for the Barnes and Noble webpage? Can you write something for the Borders book webpage? Can you write something for Powell's webpage, whatever? For one of those, I did a bibliography of 
American gods. So having that now to go back and look at, I can go, okay, well, these were my, yes, these and, were my main and sources. It's, of it's reproduced in the book, by the way. I, yes. I added onto it the books that I used in addition to the books that you used. Um, so uh, people can see what books you used. It's reproduced in the bibliography with little stars by books that were in yours. Uh, uh, there were so, some that were so bad that I, I left them behind. And, what about the American uh, side? I mean, what about the, the local? A lot, of the American, a lot of that stuff was buying American books and, and getting very, very into American history wherever I was. Traveling, I would get in the car and drive. I would do these amazing road trips, which for me were like the ultimate adventure. I would just, you know, I, I had friends, particularly Tori Amos, and um, when Tori wound up needing her house because she got pregnant, um, uh, Jonathan Ross in Florida who would give me houses they did not live in to go and, and just write. But the journey to those houses was the was the huge adventure to, for me. I would do these enormous drives around. And um, that- And say, oh, that's a cool place. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, you know, I discovered- Mermaid Park in Florida, the whatever, wiki, yes. Wikiwachi, I'd see the signs and I'd read the books. Um, Rock City, where our, our Ragnarok takes place. Yes. Um, I- had genuinely not heard of, but one of my rules doing my first big drive, and I tried to keep it up forever after, was no freeway driving except at night. Um, I'll drive freeways at night because you have no, no view driving at night wherever you are. Right. But the rest of the time, I would just wouldn't drive on freeways. I'd drive on back roads, drive on old county roads. Just I figure, okay, it's going to whack a day or so onto my travel, but the the point is the journey not the not how quickly i can get there um and i just remember you know somewhere entering tennessee i think on a back road just seeing a sign saying you know see rock city the world's marvel in a way the world's wonder that painted on the top of an old barn and i assumed this must be very close by and decided to go and find Rock City. It, and, it is a different America. I, I when I was uh, when I was very young, we took a trip on Route 66 across country from Chicago all the way to California, and you know, strange things. Signs saying the world's largest ball of string is here, and uh, you know, then then in California we have the wonderfulness of um, in Northern California we have the world's artichokes the Artichoke center of the world and the artichoke capital of the world. They're both about, they're about 10 miles apart. Um, arguing about it for generations. I think that's so beautiful. I, I loved, you know, trying to investigate where the exact center of America was, was something that I delighted in. I, I you know, doing the research, that was one of those places where I bought all the books and went into the as deep into the proto internet that we had in 1998-ish as I could and learned the history of how they worked out the exact center of America and the fact that the exact center of America actually, when they did this thing, which they did by making <laughs> America out of cardboard. <laughs> and then finding the place where it balanced. Sounds like a high school science fair project. It absolutely was. And it turned out to be on Johnny Gribbs' hog farm. And they decided the exact center of America couldn't be Johnny Gribbs' hog farm. So they found the nearest sort of open space they could put a little park on. And they put a tiny motel and a tiny chapel there. And that is the exact center of America, except it isn't. That's and the American love. spirit, you know. Exactly. So turning to the sort of the serious theme of the book, um, I, I, I 
I did some recent research just to look, and you know, we're in a, a state of affairs, according to polls, um, the number of Americans who identify themselves as Christian has declined by 12 percentage points over the last decade. Those who identify themselves as atheistic, agnostic, or nothing in particular is up almost 10 points from 2009 to 26%. Are the gods in trouble? I mean, are, is this, is this uh, uh, a new age? Uh, obviously, the pandemic is uh, um, keeping people from going to worship in places of worship, but uh, are the gods really about to get wiped out? Oh, I, th I think that the... I think that the only thing that you can be sure of uh, with gods and religions is that there is always flux, there is always change. Um, and religions and gods die eventually when nobody believes in them and nobody worships them. Um, but it's amazing how sticky some of them are. Um, I think we're in a period, we're definitely in a period of change. The, the old gods versus new gods, if it's a battle for people's attention, um, if it's a battle for time and headspace, um, which is the way that I always saw it, then the new gods over the last 20 years have made enormous inroads. Um, you know, the, the, the technical boy that I wrote about was very much the technical boy of 1999. He was a overweight kid um, who really was thrilled to have figured out how to get a pizza without having to talk to a human being. The idea that it would just be delivered to the room over the garage in his parents' house that he lived in, and he wouldn't have to talk to anybody. That was the technical boy of then. Um, the technical boy of now, you know, is is and is a billionaire. The technical boy of now is smooth and sharp and turns up at TED conferences, um, except of course, in these days of coronaviruses, there may never be another TED conference. Um, they'll they'll I, be like this? Very, very probably, or something like this. I, I, I'm really interested to see what this does to people, how they, you know, it, it may have done something very bad. It may have done something very good. I'm spending, I have never spent um, six weeks in the company of my wife and my son. <laughs> um, and nobody, uh, nothing else. You know, we're just here with our friend Xanthia and there is no going off and hanging with other people. There's no, I'm going off to the office. There's no right. any of that. We're just, we're just here. And right. we're having to actually talk and play and interact. And Ash is frustrated because he doesn't get other kids. And he's elated because he gets, he gets his you. Dad and mom yeah. all the time. Yeah. Um, and his mum gives him, you know, this morning she was, recording a song and Ash decided he wanted to play cymbals and you know this kind of four-year-old playing cymbals right um, and there's it, a it, lovely there's a lovely book that I've been uh, enjoying called a song for a new day by Sarah Pinsker uh, it's nominated for the Hugo she clearly didn't know that this was going to happen but it anticipates a time not very far in the future when the combination of terrorism and the pandemics has caused the government to enact anti-congregation laws. Nobody can be in large gatherings and all that. And the book is very much about the need for, for some community. And, and 
yes, holograms have provided concerts, Zoom has provided opportunities, et cetera, but it's not quite the same. None um, of it's the same. I'm, the thing of mine that is most interesting for me right now in a sort of, I wonder if this is gonna happen way, is the ocean at the end of the lane. Um, my novel was turned into a play by the National Theatre in the UK. And it was an enormous hit at the National and they're taking it to the West End and it was meant to be opening at the end of October. And I'm wondering if that will ever happen. I'm wondering if the theatres will ever open again. Um, and there are so many things that in order so many artistic things, particularly, that in order to make them happen, you need to get a lot of people together in the same place. Yes. To make good television. Um, Absolutely. Although they, I understand already people are figuring out technologies where actors can appear in the same scene, they can see each other, they can perform together remotely. So there'll be, there'll be pivots, there'll be massive changes, but we're not, we're not down. Um, we're, we're, as the it's queen said, a very long we time. will meet again. Yes. We will. It's been a very long time since I read a, an Isaac Asimov book called The Naked Sun. Yes, I recall um, it very well. I mean, I, and when I say a long time, I think I was eight when I read it. Um, you thought it was going to be a little bit risky maybe noise lambent would appear in it again, you know, and so on. This I, is why, by the way, this is why I joined the science fiction book club, because you may recall they, they had an ad on the back of Galaxy magazine that showed noise lambent, the heroine of the end of eternity, lying on a couch, sort of diaphanously gowned and all that. So a book called The Naked Sun really promised big stuff. You know, it was, it, this was an English edition, though. And it was an English edition in the 1960s, during that period of time where publishers were saving enormous amounts of money in the UK by having very photographic covers. And Asimov, who then got some fantastic covers from Chris Foss um, in the early 70s, um, and glorious Asimov covers, but during the 60s, most of his covers were photographs. So The Naked Sun, it was a, looked like a photograph of a city. And there was, despite the title, you knew there was gonna be nothing titillating of any kind inside, aged eight, right. aged 12, this was. Right, you, what was Asimov, first of all? It was Asimov. <laughs> Who never could write women. But no, you're right. I hadn't thought about that book. A very prescient book about people living in isolation remotely. Uh, and of course, it's a murder mystery. How does yeah. this murder get committed when people don't actually go see each other? So, And that, you know, it's a book that I was definitely thinking it would be interesting to go back to yes. 50 years gone. And because I can see a world now in which... Um, things happen remotely. And I think it also will be, if it happens like that, it will be tragic. Well, so this is a good segue to, um, now that you have all this time on your hand, what are you working on? Are you, are you working on something? Like, is this creative time or? You know, the, the tragedy, and Amanda and I came to this house and went, this is great, we have a, friend who's an assistant who's a nanny. We uh, have lots of stuff that we want to do. And look at this, we are going to get so much done. Right. And, and then, then we started finding that we're actually like paddling, dog paddling in place desperately just to keep our heads above water in the waking up every day and the email mountain that would have arrived. And I am I have had to go, okay, I, I need to forgive myself for missing emails. They are just, I'm going to miss them. It's going to happen. Um, 
I'm the flood of requests from people, all of whom think they are the only person in the world who's gone, I know what. Group X is suffering because of COVID. I will go to Neil Gaiman and ask him if he can do something that's only 15 minutes out of his day. Right. Cheer up, Group X, raise money for Group Y, or do... And then um, as my friend, uh, my, my writer friend, Hank Philippi Ryan said, who knew there was so much laundry? And, but there is, there's laundry, there's cooking, there's, there's, I cannot look at the day anymore and go, you know, I need that extra 45 minutes just to get this thing done, but that's fine. I will call in some food. I'll get some food delivered or whatever. Right. Now, anything food wise, I, you know, we're, we're planning it out days ahead so that we've made sure we've got ingredients so that we and plus, even if we've got a nanny, she, she's on, you know, if she does 10 till four um, every day, Amanda and I will take over, at, you know, then one of us is, there are rotors in this house, Les. It's all, who's doing the cleaning rotor? Who, who's, who's cooking? Who's, how do are we- Are there toilet cooking? paper shortages in New Zealand as well? Uh, I think there were for a little while, but that seems to have sorted itself out. Um, the food shortages seem to have sorted themselves out here. Um, the biggest, but, but having said that, going to the supermarket is still something that is gonna take up many, many hours of your day. And if you're gonna go, you're probably gonna get up at 5.30 to be in line at the supermarket when it's gonna open but, and the line will already have been long and yes. you go in so to, you know they're going to let you in one at a time and it's uh well all right so you're so you're on holiday right now yeah. but some writing i you know some writing is happening but for every bit of writing that happens it's being clawed out of the day it's not easy um I'm finishing an introduction tomorrow. I will wrap it up and send it uh, to George R. R. Martin's, uh, to a George R. R. Martin book. And part of the fun of that has actually been doing this mammoth reread. And George has been getting more and more anxious about me being late with it. And I'm like, yeah. George, but, it's you, George, come on. <laughs> I'm not allowed to say that. Um, but I am allowed to say, you know, I have been saying to him, no, I'm, I'm just enjoying rereading it so much and you can't rush it. Um, well, so are we ever going to see any more of Shadow, do you think, or other folks from the book? I think so. Well, there's, I've done two Shadow stories so right. far. And right. those two Shadow stories imply a third. And then there is meant to be American Gods uh, 2. Once he get once Shadow gets back to the U.S. and I have a but there's a bunch of stuff I know about American Gods too. Um, Great. Well, so this will end up being a boxed set. So one day. <laughs> um, but I think there's also me right now wanting to see how America shakes down. Yes. Um, yes. It's I, a... I I want to see what what it becomes. Um, well, let's talk, let me talk for a second about the book so that this is a, a little bit of a marketing thing. Um, uh, the, the process was really interesting. First of all, um, I have uh, a number of times publicly thanked you and your staff for giving me access to all the things that you did. Uh, the people at uh, HarperCollins, Jennifer Brell was just wonderful. Um, it was kind of an interesting experience for both of us, Jennifer and myself, sort of going through the process of this book. Um, they started out saying, uh, we don't want any pictures. And I said, okay. Um, and then I said, well, maybe I'll just send you some anyway. And she <laughs> said, fine. Uh, and so then it was like 30 or 40. And then she said, well, are there more? Uh, okay, fine. So we have almost a hundred illustrations here. And then I don't know if you know that this, we went through this whole process where she sent out the galleys, and the first 32 pages were gorgeous. Color, 
just beautiful. And the rest of the book was black and white in the galleys. And I said, oh, it's, you know, that's nice. I look forward to seeing the rest of the colored pages. She said, well, there aren't going to be any. She said, that's it. And I said, really? You know, we have all these beautiful pictures and all that. And um, ultimately, they relented. They said, fine, we'll go through, we'll delay the book. We'll make it all in color. And as you know, because you've seen it, it's just gorgeous. It is. Um, the, I, didn't, I didn't know that little story. I'm glad that you, you pushed, because the book itself is a thing of incredible beauty. It and, really is. And it, By the way, I, and, I had wanted it to happen since my then wife, Mary, read the original manuscript. And I said, what do you think? And she said, are there footnotes? <laughs> and I said, no. And she said, well, I wish there were footnotes because I don't know who these people are. And well, now, now there are a few footnotes. There's probably close to a thousand notes. The, um, the, the design of the book, fortuitously, so Jennifer and I talked a little bit about what, I, what it was going to look like, and she found a designer for the book. His sister actually did my annotated Dracula, for which you wrote the introduction, and gave him the book and said, make it look like this. That, that's another gorgeous, gorgeous book. And so, you know, real credit to HarperCollins, William Morrow people for making this a truly beautiful book. I had nothing to do with it. It's just gorgeous. Uh, and uh, I, I love to look through it and see all the beautiful colophons and the borders. So, and so let me ask you a question, Les. What was the most, as the researcher, as the person who had this novel, had, you know, two different texts of the novel um plus more than that and plus access to all of the notes and all of the early drafts and everything like that what was the most interesting thing that you found on the way what was your favorite discovery uh, the serial killer family from kansas uh, ah the, the benders yes uh, I, I had vaguely known something about them, and by the way, there's actually a graphic novel about them, uh, but uh, I hadn't done the depth of research that I ended up doing for the footnote here, and yes, that was one of my favorites. Uh, but of course, and this is a perfect segue to talk about the nameless God and how much <laughs> research time I wasted on that. Uh, nothing is wasted. Well, nothing's wasted. It's all a learning experience. Uh, so I, I know that the readers are desperate to find out in this video who the nameless God is. And I have always promised, you know, the funny thing is on things like this, um, when I was doing Sandman and people would say to me, so who is the missing member of the endless? I would say, oh, it's destruction because it was 1990, 1991. There, were, there was no internet. If I told somebody, they'd go, oh, that's interesting. And that was cool. By the time that American Gods rolled around, I was like, oh, should I tell people? Shouldn't I tell people? How does that work? And, but I thought, oh, I probably will. And then somebody wrote to my webpage and just said, please don't. And I went, oh. Okay, well, they'll find out in the next American novel, God's novel. When I, I was when just I, going to say that they'll they'll find out for sure, probably in the American Gods too. They will definitely find out in American Gods too who the nameless God was. Um, so that'll be there for them. And since then, I've actually kind of enjoyed not telling people. I've seen, you know, hundreds upon hundreds of guesses and suppositions. And um, which have not always been wrong. I've seen, I've certainly seen some accurate guesses in one direction and some accurate guesses in another direction. So, well, my carefully researched notes on the subject are absolutely inconclusive. So, excellent. Which is the way some things should be, I suppose. I think you're meant to leave things inconclusive, and I love that you 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 discovered the bloody benders and. I love that, you know, I, I, I remember just the sheer joy of being able to take 
the um, driving the characters to Kansas past the place where the Benders had been and going, you know, the way the Benders did their serial killing of travelers was the room was divided with a sheet and they had on the other side of the sheet was darkness and one side of the sheet was well lit with an oil lamp and the bender would just stand behind the sheet with a hammer. And a hammer, yes, that's the key part. Smash in the head with a hammer. And I thought Chernobog would love that. He I would mean, like those people. He would definitely would like those people. Little. And also, of course, one of the themes that runs all the way through American Gods um, is the idea of human sacrifice, is the idea that for all of these old gods, well, for pretty much all of them, the thing that you know they used to have that was so fantastic and so important to them was human sacrifice, and that is gone. Um, of course, in American Gods 2, I think I would start looking at ways that people have been sacrificed recently and what that would mean. Uh, but that would be a whole other story. All right. Well, this has been on, uh, so it's still Easter's day here in, uh, in Los Angeles. Um, so a very fitting day to have had this conversation. Uh, she would approve. She and would. Uh, it's been a pleasure to catch up uh, and to talk about this book. Um, I think it comes out on the 14th in the United States. I'm not sure when it comes out other places, the 14th, that is to say April 14th. April 14th. Um, and assuming that things stay on track, it will be in bookstores everywhere. Um, and I and hope it does really well. Everywhere as well. I mean, it's, you know, the, with luck, you will be able to either go to your bookstop, bookshop or bookstore, or you will be able to get them to send you a copy. Exactly, exactly. Well, my best to Amanda and Ash, and um, stay well, stay safe. We will, see, we will meet again. It's so lovely seeing you, and I hope that next time in the flash. Thank you.